He won a national championship in college, three Olympic gold medals, and only eight players scored more points than him. But with no success in the playoffs, many NBA fans still consider him a loser. Here is the rise and fall of Carmelo Anthony. Growing up in drug-infested Baltimore, Carmelo's childhood looked like a scene from The Wire filled with criminals, guns, and narcotics. Looking for a safe place, Carmelo found his escape through basketball. He started his middle school career as a skinny point guard, which developed his ball handling skills and shooting touch. But after a major growth spurt, Anthony sprouted to 6 foot 8 and in 2001 was named Baltimore Player of the Year. As a junior, he was averaging 23 points and 10 rebounds per game, but because he often skipped school and had terrible grades, Melo was forced to switch schools, and it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because he transferred to the famous Oak Hill Academy. With Melo on the team, Oak Hill became the most watched high school team in the US. When they matched up against LeBron James and his St. Vincent St. Mary, it felt like the NBA Finals. 11,000 spectators and 200 media members came to watch the showdown between the top junior and the best senior in the country. The game became a basketball classic and both players lived up to the hype. LeBron dropped 36 points in 12 of 27 shooting with eight rebounds and five assists. Anthony put up 34 points on 14 of 25 shooting and 11 rebounds. Despite LeBron's brilliance, Carmelo's team pulled out a 72-66 victory and finished the season with 32 wins and only one loss. After dominating the McDonald's All-American game and winning the Sprite Dunk Contest, Mello was wanted by every major college. He chose Syracuse University due to a great relationship with coach Jim Boheim. Carmelo produced one of the best freshman seasons in NCAA history, averaging 22 points and 10 rebounds per game. Mello led Syracuse in scoring, rebounding, and minutes played, and his 33-point explosion against the University of Texas in the Final Four set an NCAA tournament record for most points by a freshman. In the NCAA Finals, Syracuse played against Kansas, who trashed Dwayne Wade's Marquette by 33 points in the semifinals. But Carmelo couldn't let that happen to him. He finished with 20 points, 10 rebounds, and 7 assists to lead the Orange to a sensational victory and NCAA championship. Even though he planned to stay three years in college, Melo already climbed to the top of the mountain, and his beloved coach, Jim Boheim, advised him to go to the NBA. The entire world expected the Cavs to select LeBron with the first pick of the 2003 NBA draft and Detroit to pick Carmelo at number two. And then, a huge surprise. The Pistons opted for European prospect Darko Milicic, which meant Anthony would be selected third overall by the Denver Nuggets. Even as a rookie, there was no way to stop Carmelo Anthony. Against Wade and LeBron, a defender could step back and let them take an outside shot. But against Carmelo, it was a point of no return. The man had every possible tool in his offensive arsenal, and he'd score no matter what the defense does. If you put a bigger guy on him, Melo was so explosive that he would drive by him. If you put a smaller defender, he'd post him up and bully him on the way to the basket, or simply make a silky smooth mid-range jumper. Anthony led the Nuggets with 21 points, 6 rebounds, and 3 assists per game and became the fourth player in NBA history to capture all six of the Rookie of the Month awards in a season. However, LeBron was also a Rookie of the Month six times in the East and was voted Rookie of the Year over Anthony, despite the Cavs not making the postseason and James posting slightly lesser numbers. Denver won 17 games in the season before Melo. With him, they won 43 games and made the playoffs, their first postseason berth in nine years. Melo's first playoff series didn't go great. He struggled mightily against MVP Kevin Garnett and the Timberwolves won four games to one. Despite the loss, the hype around Carmelo was bigger than ever. He was selected to represent Team USA at the 2004 Olympics where he got into his first big fight with a coach, something that would later become a far too regular occurrence. Larry Brown played Sean Marion and Richard Jefferson instead of Melo and LeBron, and Anthony openly protested due to a lack of playing time. Brown then torpedoed Carmelo to the end of the bench, and the Americans failed to win Olympic gold for the first time ever with NBA players. When the next season started, Anthony argued with his Nuggets coach, who then got replaced by George Carl. In the beginning, everything was wonderful and Carmelo did his job as a scorer perfectly. Even though he was never interested in playing defense, he directly brought victories to the Nuggets five times with clutch buckets in the last seconds. All of his five game winners were jump shots. The Nuggets made the playoffs again, but immediately lost to the later champions, San Antonio Spurs. Then, in 2006, Melo's scoring average soared to 26.5 points per game. 
but the result was the same, and the Nuggets lost in the first round of the playoffs once more. In the first eight games of the following season, Melo went over 30 points six times. But then, another huge disappointment. In December of 2006, when the Nuggets played the Knicks at Madison Square Garden, one of the biggest player fights in NBA history ensued. Almost every player from both teams was involved in the brawl, and after Anthony slapped Marty Collins, he earned a 15-game suspension. He then started hanging out with the newly acquired J.R. Smith more intensively, and Carmelo's focus quickly shifted from basketball to partying. And on February 2nd, 2007, all that partying almost cost Carmelo and JR their lives, when after one wild night out, Melo and JR were involved in a car accident. But even after their life flashing before their eyes, nothing changed. Then, the arrival of Allen Iverson was definitely not an injection of professionalism for the team. And soon enough, there were videos of drunk nuggets in front of the nightclub. Even though they had a decent team on paper, Denver simply did not have the chemistry or maturity for a serious result. Anthony averaged 29 points, 6 rebounds, and 4 assists that year, and he finally made the All-Star team. But the Nuggets lost to the Spurs in the first round of the playoffs again. 2008 was a different year, but the story was the same. Melo and Iverson averaged over 25 points each, but the Nuggets lost in the first round for the fifth year in a row, this time getting swept by the Lakers. Anthony then suited up for Team USA at the 2008 Beijing Olympics and finally washed the sour taste of defeat from his mouth. Melo impressed with his outside shooting during the tournament and the Americans finally brought the gold medal home. With the Olympic success and being around Kobe and LeBron, we saw a more mature Melo. Trading Iverson away and bringing veteran point guard Chauncey Billups also helped and Anthony played the best basketball of his life. The Nuggets won 54 games in a season, which was their best result in 20 years, and Melo sacrificed shots for the better of the team. Then in the playoffs, the Nuggets finally advanced past the first round, defeating the Hornets 4-1. In the second round, Carmelo played the best playoff series of his life. He averaged 30 points with phenomenal shooting numbers, and Denver defeated Dirk Nowitzki and the Mavericks in five games. Against Kobe and the Lakers in the conference finals, the Nuggets tied the series at 2-2 before returning to Los Angeles. But in the rest of the series, Denver wasn't up to the task and the Lakers advanced to the finals. Despite the loss, it was the best season in recent Nuggets history. Carmelo was entering his prime and Denver fans were expecting a berth to the NBA Finals soon. Unfortunately, the only thing they got was a bitter disappointment. In 2010, despite Carmelo averaging 30 points in the series, the Nuggets lost in the first round again. Throughout the entire 2010 and 2011 season, Carmelo had conflicts with Coach Carl. He was even suspended once because he refused to leave the game when the coach asked him to, so Carmelo decided to ask for a trade. The disbelief of Denver fans soon turned into open hatred. Anthony did not want a contract extension. He wanted to go to a team of his choice, more precisely, the New York Knicks. After months of public fights and bickering in the media that was dubbed the melodrama, the Nuggets realized it was best to trade Carmelo than lose him for nothing three months later, like the Cavs lost LeBron a year before. They traded Anthony to New York in a multi-team trade, and the Knicks lost a lot of depth for a player that could have signed for free if they waited just half a season. But they wanted Melo now, and he wanted them. Too bad their gamble didn't pay off. Even though he played with the best teammate of his life in Amari Stoudemire, the Knicks got swept in the first round of the 2011 playoffs. One of the main reasons for the lack of success was the inability of Melo and Stoudemire to work together. Even though Anthony always insisted on playing the small forward position because he did not want to scrap and wrestle with tall and stronger players in the post, his ideal role was that of the stretch four. He was at his best when he scored from isolation in the high post, spreading out the defense with outside shots, driving by slower defenders, and making lots of mid-range shots. His offensive play, while outdated by today's standards, was damn effective. However, due to his stubbornness to play small forward, he was never a great defensive player. Melo was always a bit too slow laterally to guard the best small forwards effectively and extremely unmotivated to play top-notch defense for more than a few possessions. That wouldn't be such a big problem if Amari wasn't almost the same player as Melo. They liked to occupy the same real estate on offense and were equally bad defensively, what showed in the results. The Knicks regularly played better when one of them was not in the lineup. It didn't take much for Anthony to start beefing with coach Dan Tony and complain about the tactics. To keep their superstar happy, the Knicks fired Dan Tony. Mike Woodstock took his place, and the team started playing better. Lynn's sanity was in full effect. Tyson Chandler got voted Defensive Player of the Year, and the chemistry improved. 
but the Knicks lost in the first round of the playoffs to the Heat, partially because Amari punched through the glass of a fire extinguisher after a Game 2 loss, which resulted in him playing with a cast on his hand for the rest of the series. Then came the summer, and the wounds healed again. The Olympics in London promoted Anthony, along with Durant, as an American player who is best suited for international competitions. Melo shot like he was hypnotized, and his 37 points in 15 minutes against Nigeria was a true masterpiece. Team USA won another gold, and just like that, he blossomed again. And the 2013 post-Olympic NBA season brought peak Carmelo. The addition of Jason Kidd stabilized the flow of the Knicks offense, and Carmelo thrived as a finisher, not dribbling the ball half as much as he used to. Anthony replaced a lot of long twos with threes and averaged 28.7 points per game, which brought him an NBA scoring title. He played the most efficient basketball of his career, and the Knicks won 54 games, their best result since 1997. Even without Amari Stoudemire, who went down with a knee injury, Melo led the Knicks to a playoff series win, defeating the aging Celtics in the first round. But in the second round, the Heat were just too good, and Carmelo was quickly kicked out from the postseason. In 2014, Kidd retired, and Melo suddenly found himself in a strange situation. He expected to be paired with another superstar surrounded by solid role players in a big market that would adore him and celebrate him as a savior. However, Amari was destroyed with knee injuries, and in just three seasons, the Knicks lost all perspective, squandered all their assets, and ruined any future with illogical trades and stupid contracts. New York never made the playoffs in the next four years, changing coach after coach until it was finally time to trade Carmelo Anthony away. Melo then joined forces with Russell Westbrook and Paul George in Oklahoma, and it didn't go well. Melo's averages dropped from 24 points and 3 assists to just 16 points, 1 assist, and some pretty inefficient shooting. But the worst part was that all of his numbers decreased further in the playoffs, and OKC lost in the first round. So his next stop was Houston. Who figured that a 34-year-old Carmelo could change his habits and adjust to playing without the ball and shoot only 3-pointers? That proved to be a gigantic failure. Melo didn't fit into their offense, and at this point of his career, he was an absolute nightmare defensively. After just 10 games, Melo was cut, but that wasn't the worst part. The worst and most insulting thing was that nobody wanted to sign Carmelo for the rest of the season, even though he was a 12-time All-Star who scored over 25,000 points. The entire season passed by, and Carmelo was still teamless. The next season started, and Melo was yet to play pro basketball, until finally, after a few injuries to their roster, the Portland Trailblazers gave him a chance. Against all odds, Melo started playing great after a one-year absence. Finally swallowing his ego and buying into a team concept, he became a solid role player who shoots threes, moves without the ball, and at least tries to be engaged defensively. Then after two years in Portland, he signed with the Lakers and joined his longtime friend LeBron James. It was with the Lakers at the age of 37 that Melo had the most efficient shooting percentages of his career, which showed us he was still an offensive genius and that he was quite inefficient when he was in his prime. So what's the legacy of Carmelo's career? Melo was arguably the best isolation scorer in the NBA in his prime. Kobe even called him the toughest player he ever had to guard. He had a quick first step for a player of his height, perfect footwork, deceptive athleticism, soft shooting, and a determination to score that made him a walking bucket. He averaged 25 points per game with the Nuggets in the slowest era of NBA basketball, when teams didn't shoot any threes and would rarely get past 100 points, so his 25 points were worth more than they are worth today. The problem is that the Nuggets, just like the Knicks, didn't assemble very good teams around him. Over the years, Melo has always had solid teammates, but he never actually had an eight-man rotation to contend for the title. But another big reason for Melo winning only three playoff series in his career was Melo himself. He was too stubborn, always fighting with the coaches, too selfish to change his offensive diet and play the power forward position, and too lazy to stay engaged on defense. Every coach's ideal is when your best player is also your leader. But since Carmelo only played hard on one side of the ball, he made it plain he couldn't lead the Nuggets, even though he said he wanted to. Coaching him meant working around his defense and compensating for his attitude. George Carl said in his book, after coaching Carmelo for six years, in our book, the biggest what if of his career is what if he was drafted second overall by the Pistons instead of Darko. Detroit won the 2004 title with Milicic playing garbage time minutes. Then they went to another finals and three more conference finals. If they had Carmelo on their team surrounded by all those veterans, 
they would have probably influenced him to become a better defender and great overall player. And his scoring would probably propel the Pistons to at least one or two more championships. The basketball world would probably look differently at Carmelo if he had won three NBA titles next to his NCAA championship and three Olympic gold medals. But this never happened and his game and legacy ended up to be extremely similar to Bernard King and Tracy McGrady, phenomenal scorers who never had success in the playoffs.